Cheers. Cheers. Hi folks, welcome back to the channel and welcome to my van. Today, lockdown has been eased in Scotland, which means it's the first time in over 100 days that you can travel for more than five miles. So taking every opportunity in this beautiful Scottish summer weather, and we're gonna head up to Inverness and start the North Coast 500. This is a loop around the top of the Scottish mainland and it will take maybe about four days to do. So let's do it. That's us just making our way over the bridges out of Edinburgh. We've got about three hours journey to Inverness and that's where the 500 starts from. So we start there in Inverness and we're gonna go in an anti-clockwise direction. I think this is the best way to go uh, because most of the stunning scenery is over on the west coast. So here we go, crossing the Keswick Bridge at the start of our North Coast 500 adventure. The purist might note straight away this is not the official route out of Inverness, but this is my first tip. There's no need to follow an exact path. Today, despite being summertime, we were guided by the weather and decided to take a slightly more direct route to the north coast. The east coast section is not the star of this route, and so by going anti-clockwise out of Inverness, you'll certainly be saving the best for later in the trip. There are some nice little fishing harbours as well as the stunning Dunrobin Castle, but we were happy to push on to the northeast tip of the mainland. John O'Groves. The next thing I'd say is don't expect too much at John O'Groves, especially in a day like today. The sea stacks and lighthouse at Duncansby Head, however, are spectacular in any weather and only a short drive away. And this is where we'd spend the first night. Day one and the weather hasn't been too kind to us. So it's time to get the van set up. We got a tarp. This cost 10 quid to make. This little tarp, as I say, cost 10 pounds to put this together. And it's holding up pretty well. It's a uh, it's obviously raining, but it's quite windy as well. Um, but it just gives a nice little extension to the back of the van. And in a nice day, it'd be possible to keep the doors open all night, I guess. Hopefully later on in the trip, that might happen. That space actually looks so inviting tonight. And despite this weather outside, I think this is going to be quite cosy. Number 10, what's going on? Good morning. Day two started with some nice views out over the Orkney Islands. I always forget how close they are to the mainland. I also had a walk down to the cliffs to see the puffins and the sheep before we packed up and headed along the top coast. Castle of May is normally a nice stop, but it was still closed as we ease out of lockdown. 
Dunnet Head, the true northernmost point of the mainland, was next with another impressive Robert Stevenson lighthouse and more views out over Orkney. After a quick stop for coffee and the best scones we've ever tasted, we were arriving in Betty Hill. For me, around here is where the North Coast 500 really starts to come into its own. Gradually the scenery will change, the roads will become narrower and the mountains taller. Around this time the weather was also showing some signs of improvement, just in time for a visit to one of my favourite beaches in the world, which I swear wouldn't look out of place in the Seychelles. Lots of little nooks and crannies to explore on this picture perfect beach, just don't expect it to normally be this quiet in July. Soon you'll be arriving in Durness and the east has now become the west. This is a great little place to stock up on fuel and other essentials. There are also loads of accommodation options on offer here. From Durness you have easy access to Cape Wrath and Sandwood Bay. Cape Wrath requires a short ferry crossing but it's on my wish list for the future. A chunk of it is owned by the Ministry of Defence so don't be surprised if you hear some explosions during some pretty big military exercises here. Sandwood Bay and its beach have long been on my wish list, and with enough light left in the day, we decided to give it a shot today. We've just come out of Durness, and we are down here, I think. So I think if we keep going down this road, go up to Kinloch Barvey, possibly drive a little bit further and then we can do the walk which is I think about five miles up to Sandwood Beach and Sandwood Beach is haunted Just the drive out to Blairmore Car Park at the start of this walk was absolutely spectacular and I'm so sorry that my footage here doesn't do it justice. It's like a different world. This is another tip, if you have time please make these little detours, I promise you won't regret it. So here we go, the walk starts to Sandwood Bay, Sandwood Beach, haunted. Well, I'm not sure if it's haunted, but I still probably would be too scared to camp out there alone if I'm honest. But there is so much myth and magic associated with Sandwood. 
The fairly long walk to get there almost guarantees you a quiet beach to soak up the atmosphere of this very special place. If you are brave enough to spend the night, I believe there are a couple of bothies in the area if you don't fancy pitching a tent. They'll offer a bit more warmth and protection from the ghosts and the sheep. The five mile walk to get there wasn't too bad actually, the toughest part was getting over the sand dunes as you approach the beach itself. There's a stack. We've made it to Sandwood Beach. We've got cooking equipment, pots and pans, meals, no matches! The light at the beach on this July evening was gorgeous, a perfect spot for photographers I'd guess. From all the real stuff that's happened here, my favourite story is of a Spitfire pilot who got into trouble and crash landed on the beach. He walked away unharmed and I believe you can still see the engine in certain weather conditions when the sand reveals some of its colourful history. Meanwhile, I was just acting like a big kid. <laughs> the sky is looking very low so we're going to head back. We're just cooking up a storm at the moment after that walk out to Sandwood Beach. Ah, tired and hungry. Cheers. The weather at the start of day three was absolutely crazy. So here's the most obvious tip. Pack and prepare for anything, even in what we Scots call summer. The sun came out for like two minutes, so we tried to make a late breakfast and then it started raining again. No breakfast today. Soon we were arriving in Loch Inver. We've been here before and it's a great place to base yourself for walking at two of my favourite mountains, Sylvan and Stack Polly. There's also a great beach near here at Achmelvich. 
Had the weather been better, the kayak might have been out. By this stage of the trip, I'm sure you'll be used to the narrow roads and the passing places, but here's a warning. The road out of Loch Inver is especially crazy. To be honest, it's the only road I don't enjoy driving on the whole of the north coast. Some of the blind corners on scary wee roads are not for the faint-hearted, even on a quiet day like today. I guess there are detours you could take to avoid this stretch of road. I certainly wouldn't attempt it in a bigger van or when towing. Just bear in mind you might need to do a bit of awkward reversing to allow traffic to pass. I can't even imagine what it would be like on a normal summer day. If you do decide to take on this road, my only tip would be drive slowly, stay focused and be prepared to meet some of the locals along the way. Oh, come on, Buster. One bonus of this road is the access to Stack Polly. There's a car park and it's an easy walk up to the craggy peak. It might not have Monroe status, but it's awesome fun up there. Breakfast wrap at two o'clock in the afternoon. Oh. Alapool's a strange one for me. It's a nice enough place, but it always feels like you're coming back into civilization, and every time I arrive I just want to turn around and head back for the hills. That said, the North Coast 500 still has some treats in store south of here, especially around Torridon. Look at this fella just hanging about the car park. Always keep your eyes peeled, you never know who you'll spot. South of Torridon you'll soon be hugging the coast again, and on a clear day this will give you some gorgeous views out over Rona, Rassi and sky beyond. It always seems to be sunny when I drive this coastline, and I've met some hairy coos here in the past, not this time I'm afraid. We were going to spend the night in Applecross, but decided to head a bit further and higher to get some phone signal to check tomorrow's weather. As you can see, it's very different up here. This is another road you really need to take care on, and the weather we see here today is not unusual at any time of year, but wait till you see the treat in store going down the other side in the morning.
The Southern Pass at Applecross is in my mind Scotland's coolest road. I'll link the full drive here or in the description below. Try to do this one early in the morning to avoid too much traffic, I've seen some hairy moments here in the past. It's a tricky drive with tight bends but it's so worth it. After all that fun, it's just now a few short miles into Loch Carron. This cute little village is decision time. To complete the 500 proper, from here you'll continue on to Inverness. But with the best of the route now behind us, we decided to turn right and head back to Edinburgh via Sky and Glencoe. Exciting train cross that I've ever seen. When the weather is right and it's not too busy, Sky is always an easy decision. Once over the bridge, we headed up the east coast to do some walking. The road back down to Edinburgh from here included a stop at Aelandonan Castle and then overnight at the Three Sisters in Glencoe. And for the last time in this trip, the ever graceful crawl into the back of the van. Thanks so much for taking the time to watch today, I really hope it gives you a bit of a feel for this great road trip. If you've got any questions, please just leave a little comment below, I do try to respond to them all. Thanks again and see you soon.